you, you, you are now listening to the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. To the Project Kuwait. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professional professions. So you can learn, lift, and live with your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mandy. I started it back in 2008. So to be clear, I did not invent it. I brought it back to life. The one thing that we do a little different at Spikeball than I think most companies is everybody has an abnormally high level of autonomy in what they do. Whether you're a seasoned executive and you've been working for 20 years or it's your first job out of college, we get emails from retailers all over the world, maybe a couple a week from different countries, and that's kind of the norm. But about a year ago, we got emails from five different retailers in Norway in one day saying, we'd like to carry your product. Yeah. It turns out that Shark Tank ran in Norway the night before. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's who knew? Awesome. Yeah, that's it's, it's awesome. this gift that just keeps giving. And yeah, everybody on the show, from the producers to the sharks, they all were super nice. Even Mr. Wonderful was very complimentary and much nicer than I expected. So yeah, it was a great experience. All this and more in today's episode. I mean, Chris, the founder, CEO of an awesome game that kind of made its way into Kuwait a few years ago and you know, showed up on the d one scene, Spikeball. So how did it get started? <laughs> I started it back in 2008. So to be clear, I did not invent it. I brought it back to life. So Spikeball was originally launched in 1989. I was about 14 years old at the time. And one of my buddies bought it at a local toy store, brought it back to the neighborhood. We started playing it, fell in love with it and played on and off over the years. And people would always ask us about the game and, you know, where, how do you play? Where can I get it? And we could never really answer that where can I get it part because from what little we understood, it launched in 1989 and it died in 1991. So it was only around for about two years. So we played it from 89 up until like 2003, I think it was. Me and those same friends, it was me, my brother, and a couple of childhood friends went on a trip to Kauai in Hawaii. And one of our friends brought this like beat up old spike ball set. And that kind of rekindled my love for it. You know, we're now adults uh, playing and same thing happened. Like people would ask us about it and where can I get it? And at that point, we started just kind of joking around like, oh, I wonder if we could actually like bring this thing back to life. Like we love it. All these strangers seem to be into it. So we did nothing for a couple of years. We just talked about it. And then finally, I was like, all right, I'm going to talk to some attorneys and see if we can legally bring this back to life. So we learned that the trademark and trademark had been expired for, I don't know, 10 years or something like that. There never was a patent. And we decided to take a swing at, at bringing it back. So here we are. <laughs> Amazing. It's like, the old like uh, night games or yard games that you used to play as a kid. I don't know what you guys called it. Did yes. you grow up in Chicago? Yeah, or small town yeah. Kankakee, about an hour outside. Okay. But yeah, so like, I feel like that's a, a Midwest term. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people compare it to like uh, jarts or like lawn darts, yes, right? Like, yes, oh, lawn games. Bring that back, and so. yeah, it's definitely making its way around. My, I've got a group of friends that do like a beer Olympics in the summer, and spike ball <laughs> is one of the events. <laughs> <laughs> For a while there, if you would Google best beach drinking game, we yes. literally came up number one. <laughs> because years ago, I think it was the Orange County Register in California did an article where I think that was the headline. I don't think we still have that title, but some consider it the greatest drinking game. Others consider it a great cross-training tool. And, you know, we've got serious athletes from the NBA to soccer stars in Europe and all sorts of people using it in all sorts of different ways. So sort of a, a universal tool, if you will. Awesome. So the first step was getting an attorney, like you said, and making sure legally you were in the clear to sort of revive it. And then yep. was it just a passion project on the side or like what were the next steps in, I guess, getting it to where it is now and how it's worldly now they're out in we talked about in Kuwait and Dubai, they're having beach parties doing it at the Duaneos. It's <laughs> no, I've never it's been to Kuwait. I got to join some of these parties. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. So once we got sort of the go ahead from the attorney, then yeah, and it was definitely a passion project. I had sales job. I worked at Microsoft at the time and, uh, you know, had a wife and uh, a newborn. So I had some 
serious responsibilities where, you know, I couldn't just quit the job and kind of do it. So it's like, all right, let's launch this, but I'll run it as like a side job. And, you know, hopefully it turns into something. If it doesn't, no big deal, but, you know, let's just see what happens. So, yeah, so we got the approval from the attorneys and then just started talking to friends and friends of friends. And it turns out that one of my friends knows the guy that runs the company that makes all the little plastic toys for Happy Meals at McDonald's. And that company turned out to be our first manufacturer. You know, they're used to getting orders from McDonald's for like, you know, 30, 40 million units. And we roll in there and say, yes, we'd like 1,000 spike ball sets. And (laughs) thankfully, they didn't laugh us out of the room and talk to another friend that's a product designer and graphic designer. So he helped design the logo and the website and the packaging and all that. And I think one thing that helped was just my just sheer ignorance. I have a degree in photojournalism. I talked my way out of all my business classes in college and just really knew absolutely nothing, but I was just passionate about this. Like, you know, while my day job paid well, I didn't really have much passion for it. I never really got a say in sort of what we did. I was just kind of told what to do. And sadly, I think that's the way most jobs work. So when I actually had this side project, I'm like, wait, It's a game that I love, but I actually get to have a say in sort of how we're going to go to market, how we're going to like just all these different things. I think that's what was just so exhilarating and just so foreign to me. So yeah, wound up, you know, we ordered those thousand sets and got the website built and went into business officially in June of 2008 and just had a party down at um, uh, North Avenue Beach here in Chicago. A lot of people don't realize that Chicago actually has beaches. We are right on Lake <laughs> Michigan and it's yeah. fresh water and they're beautiful beaches. So yeah, had, I don't know, 30, 40 people down there and just brought a bunch of spike ball sets and strangers would walk by and ask about it. And when they'd stop and ask, I literally had a clipboard and a pen and would write down their email address and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'll email you next time we're playing. And it was just kind of a million turns of that flywheel. And you know, every day I'd get home from the day job and hang out with wife and kids. They go to bed around eight or nine and then spike ball work would begin. I'd do that until maybe one or two in the morning. And our first warehouse was my basement. So I had, I don't know, 800 sets down there and around <laughs> midnight or so. I'd go down to the basement. I'd grab one box. If I had a really good day of sales, I'd grab two boxes. And then I'd drive to the post office. There was a late night post office not far from my house drop them off, do the same thing the next day, the next day. And eventually it kept growing and growing. And in 2013, so after doing that for about five years, we had a million dollars in annual revenue with zero full-time employees. And at that time, my wife and I agreed it was safe for me to quit the day job and go full-time. So that was one of the best days of my life calling the boss and giving my two weeks. So (laughs) that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And sometimes, I mean, passion drives sales more than anything in the world. I mean, if you're passionate about something, you're going to sell it hard and, you know, do a damn good job. Quick question that I had. I mean, my background's marketing. I used to be a marketer. I marketed Taco Bell to Kuwaitis, essentially Mexican food, which was the (laughs) hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life. So how was the relaunch of this and how much went into it? Was it at a minimal budget, more of a word of mouth thing? Or how did you do it? Yeah, it was, I'd say word of mouth has, even to this day, that's still our strongest form of marketing. You know, if I think way back to that trip to Hawaii, what happened then is still what happens today. Our best form of marketing is people playing the game. Yeah. So when we first launched, I kind of followed conventional wisdom and was like, oh, I need to spend a ton of money on Google AdWords. And if people are into volleyball, I don't know, I assume they'll be into spike ball, you know, very similar kind of rules and all that. So I spent thousands of dollars getting people, volleyball, people that are searching for volleyball or volleyball related terms to come to spikeball.com. And they came, traffic went through the roof, but sales, absolutely nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So I kind of woke up and I'm like, huh, this traffic's great, but I can't pay the bills with traffic. I can pay the bills with revenue. So what can I do? And one thing that actually did work, and this wasn't because I was so smart, I just got lucky. I was, you know, as sales would come in and they're literally trickling in, I would send a personal email to every single customer. And back then our sales were only at spikeball.com. Now we're in Target, uh, we're in Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, most large 
retailers in the U.S. We're starting to get into more brick and mortar retail in Europe. I don't know if we're any brick and mortar retailers in Kuwait. I don't think we are yet. Yeah, no, as far I, as I know, everybody has brought it from the States. Yeah, I, I couldn't get one. I was, I was trying to get one when I was introduced to it, when I saw it, yeah. like at a bunch of places. And can't, I, I can't find one out here and I can't get one shit. Yeah. So it was t- it's tough. We need to swap notes after this. I need to get some sure you guys are connected to some people that can help make this happen. But yes, a sale would come in via spikeball.com. And I'd, you know, let's say that we got an order from somebody from, I don't know, San Francisco. And I'd reply to them and I'd say, oh, hey, Meg, thanks for the order. I am going to head to the post office tonight. Uh, it should show up in a couple days. By the way, I see you live in San Francisco. You know, what a beautiful city. I lived there for, I used to live there for a couple of years. By the way, if you don't mind me asking, how'd you hear about Spikeball? Right. That last question could not have been more influential to our overall success. So I heard from three distinct groups. One was physical education teachers. So PE teachers, at least in the U.S., are always looking for new games. Mm -hmm. They don't have a whole lot of money. Our price point is 59 U.S. And I wouldn't have thought to reach out to PE teachers, but we love them because, you know, if we sell one to them, that is seen by hundreds of kids at that school. And those students will probably go home and say, hey, mom and dad, I'd like one for my birthday or for Christmas or, you know, for whatever. The second group was ultimate Frisbee players. I don't play ultimate. My friends don't play ultimate, but somehow the seed got planted in ultimate. So I heard so many people tell me, oh, hey, yeah, I love, you know, just bought the set. My ultimate coach told me about it, or I went to an ultimate tournament. So we started getting notes from ultimate Frisbee players asking us if we'd sponsor their tournaments and sponsor their teams. And it turns out what they really just wanted was gas money to get to the tournament. So we said, all right, we'll give you the $300 for the sponsorship. But here's what we're going to do. You know, how many tournaments do you have in this season? And these are college students. They, I don't know, say maybe they have 10 tournaments in the season. I'd say, all right, I'm going to send you 11 spike ball sets. One of them you have to use at every tournament you go to. And you have to text me pictures of you guys playing. But you have to also give away one spike ball set to your favorite opponent at every tournament. So now our product is being introduced to a new college at minimum, at least one, but most likely a bunch because, you know, there's probably a dozen colleges attending each of these. And also imagine if you're one of those players, you're the recipient, uh, more or less a stranger that you just competed against, walks up to you after the game and says, hey, I'd like to give you this spike ball set. We're sponsored by them. And I was told to give it to somebody that I just enjoyed competing against. That's brilliant. About That's a great How yeah. nice that feel, right? Yeah. You yeah. Know it's only the best players or the winners of something that get the prize. But at Spike Ball, we care a lot more about your overall character and just yeah. kind of, you know, are you a good person? So it just took off like wildfire within the ultimate community. And then the third group, you know, I again send that email saying, How'd you hear about us? And was faith based youth groups. So I'm not a particularly person of any specific faith. Church is not a big thing in my life, but I kept hearing from people talking about this group called Young Life. And I had never heard of Young Life and I Google it and it's this huge global like Christian high school group where if you're a member of it, you go to your local Young Life uh, meeting, I think like once a week or every couple of weeks. And there may be like 60 students that go to this one student's house and they hang out in their living room for two hours. The first hour, they sit around and talk about their faith. And the second hour, they have some sort of physical activity, like a team bonding kind of a thing. And somehow Spikeball got in that community and word started traveling really well. And the one thing that that is consistent amongst those three groups, PE teachers, ultimate players, and faith-based groups, they're all very tight communities. So if you can get your product into one of them and they like it, it -hmm. will travel on its own. And I didn't realize that until after it was already happening. So what I realized there was, all right, I had identified some fires that had been lit. You know, I didn't sit around one day and say, yeah, I think Ultimate Frisbee would be a great community or I think faith-based. Like, no, I just asked the question to Ask where- the right questions, yeah. Yeah, once we identified that fire, then decided to pour gasoline on it. So then I then started shipping free sets to, all, to Young Life groups all over the country. We got orders from like Young Life Berlin and- Free sets to PE teachers. And to this day, that group has, they're all still very important groups to us. Maggie mentioned, I believe, did you say you're uh, in the CrossFit community? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, so, a lot of our listeners are in that community as well. That's what brought me out to Kuwait originally, um, was setting up some of the first yeah, fitness facilities and things out there. So yeah. Got it. Big yeah. A couple of years there. ago, we noticed on um, 
Instagram that a lot of CrossFit top athletes starting to post photos of them playing spike ball inside their boxes. And I was like, yeah. hmm. and we noticed that a couple, I'm not a CrossFitter, I forget some of their names, but a couple like world champs were doing it. So we just said, hey, we'll start sending you guys free sets. And next thing you know, we're sponsoring CrossFit games in LA and just trying to become a part of the community. And now it's just kind of blown up on its own. So you know, that, yeah, that it was example, perfect. Yeah, I was going to say just, the, the example of me going out to the volleyball players and trying to get them into it, that was me trying to light a fire and it mm-hmm. failed, right? You know, I, I bought the, the volleyball keywords on Google. I actually went to go meet some volleyball players here in Chicago and they hated it. They were like, no, like they're used to being good <laughs> at their sport, right? And they were super nice. I said, you know, during their downtime, I was like, hey, you know, I'm Chris, I got this new company. Would you mind playing with this? Like, yeah, we'd love to. And they played it for 10 minutes and they hated it. That was me trying to light a fire. Trying to light a fire is so much harder than just taking the time to identify one that is maybe already lit and just pour gas on it. Absolutely. That makes total sense. I love, and I think part of the the success, maybe in the beginning, you talk about not having, you know, kind of stepping into an area where you were maybe unqualified to (laughs) kick off a business at that time. You know, it wasn't what you were doing full time or the education background wasn't there. And that's, something that I think a lot of people holds them back from maybe stepping forward in a passion project is that thought of, well, I'm not qualified enough to do this. But I think that plays in your favor because you were able to go back to that beginner mindset where people might have a lot in that business world might have a lot of fixed ideas of why this wouldn't be revived, why this couldn't work. It was already a thing before. Why did it die kind of thing? And you really took and ran with that and look at what you've been able to do and not only just create this cool game and communities out of it, we talk about the values that pushed you to continue doing it and how that gets even translated into your sponsorships and stuff. I think it's, I had no idea spike ball was so deep. <laughs> <laughs> I think that sort of lack of experience or lack of qualification almost gives you a license to be an idiot. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> which I was and am, you know, if I had an MBA and all this fantastic experience and everything, maybe my ego would have gotten in the way of me actually going down to the beach and just standing there with a clipboard and a pen. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I don't know, but I'd imagine that probably played a role in it. And But I didn't know what I didn't know. I'd never started a company. I don't know anything about sports or I didn't know anything about sports or marketing or anything, but I was like, I'll just try. And I am not good at acknowledging what I don't know and then also I'm comfortable enough tapping strangers on the shoulder. Like I, I still do this a decent amount on like LinkedIn or Twitter, et cetera. I'll just send strangers a note saying, hey, you seem to know more about this topic than I do. I'd love to either get on a call or meet for a coffee and just kind of ask you some questions. And nine out of 10 people ignore me, but that one person that actually replies, there's a lot of value there. And, you know, I'll, one of our values at Spikeball is surprise and delight. So usually as a thank you for their time, I'll leave them with a Spikeball set or something like that. And yeah, yeah. But I was very unqualified to start <laughs> this company as a whole. But it's clearly it's, an advantage. Yeah. yeah. I mean, starting the company, but you're also starting, you have a Spikeball league, correct? Yeah. So we've got tournaments happening all over the world. Actually, we did. Uh, unfortunately, we've been canceling a bunch of them due mm-hmm. to... COVID-19. But yeah, we've been doing tournaments in the U.S. for years. So we've had the U.S. National Championship for, I don't know, six, seven years now. We have regional championships. So we run, as a company, we run a decent amount of tournaments ourselves, but way more what we call independent tournaments where really anybody can host one. And we will basically help you, you know, if, if the tournament's big enough, we'll help you with some equipment if you need it, ship you some loaner stuff. But tournaments in Europe are really taking off right now. This at the end of August, we have our first ever world championship taking place in Belgium. That's awesome. I think we've got almost 20 countries registered so far now. And that's going to be a blast. I'm hoping we can still have it. It's, It's far enough out where I'm hoping we'll be safe. But the one cool thing about the community is it's it's very inclusive. Almost all sports, you have to qualify to compete in the world championship. If you've never played spike ball before and you want to compete in our world championship, all you have to do is register and show up. 
Now, you're not going to be able to compete in the premier division. Now, that you do have to qualify for. If you want to be an official representative of your country, you have to be in, I think, the top 10 or something like that, or there are qualifications. But if you're a 10-year-old kid and you want to play with your 70-year-old grandfather and the two of you want to come compete together, then we would love to have you. Anybody and everybody can play. So, But the cool thing is most of these tournaments, tournaments as a whole were not our idea. We noticed that people were doing it on their own. And you know, it started with just maybe somebody showed up with a piece of paper and just drew up some brackets on a single sheet with like 10 friends. And now we've got rankings. We've got companies calling us about sponsoring our events. We had a couple tournaments show up on ESPN2 here. It's been insane to see how it's all been going. And it's, it's almost been all grassroots. Like, you know, if you look at our overall marketing spend, it's, it's a fraction of what most consumer products are. And we have a really, really tight relationship with our community. And we just try to make sure that we're, we're following their lead. It's usually if it's us trying to take the first step, then that may not work as well. But if we can remain tight enough with them, we'll have a good idea of sort of what they're looking for. And then we've got the resources where we can do some some pretty fun things. I have a question about the league. I mean, you know, with these tournaments, it reminds me a lot about backyard stickball. And when I was a kid, we'd play backyard <laughs> stickball. And then it just evolved into this game where we, were, we weren't even running anymore. It'd just be, you know, hit the ball if it goes over this fence or that fence or this, you know. Yep. So how have you guys managed the rules of it? Because I'm sure that with the game evolving, people are evolving the rules when they play. So how is that? Been? Yeah. So in the early days, like even within the U.S., we'd like see that West Coast players would have slightly different ways than slightly different rules than East coast players and Midwest players would have a little different than the other, all these different sort of different versions. So we had to standardize that, but I didn't want that, those standards to come from me or just some other people at spike ball where we just kind of say, here's the rules, everybody, you have to listen. So we have a board which is assembled of majority of players, minority of employees. A lot of our employees are super passionate and, you know, they will, debate you for five hours long about whether the serving distance should be six feet or five feet. Like it is insane how passionate people are, but we want to make sure that that board is made up by majority of players so that, you know, it's not the employees that may show up and maybe they have an ulterior motive of, Oh, if we change this rule, we can make more money or we can do whatever that's good for us. So, so we rely on them and, you know, I know most of the rules, but like, what what is a what's considered a I remember I was sitting at we we're usually after most of our tournaments, we'll invite people to like a local pizza place or something and I'll put a credit card down and we'll say, all right, pizza and beers are on spike ball for the night. Let's just all have some fun. And it is fun, but it's also secretly like our R and D. Like we learned so much from players just by talking to them and hanging out. And I was a part of a conversation where they were the argument almost got a little heated about what what is considered a pivot? Like when you're serving, are you allowed, like what, what's a pivot foot? Does that mean the ball of your foot is allowed to lift or the heel or both, or can you twist? And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just loved it where I was just listening to that conversation. I wasn't driving it. And mm. it was the board that was talking about it. And they eventually agreed what should be appropriate. And I, you know, as CEO, yes, I, I do have the power to kind of, you know, do what I want, but I'm very nervous about using that power because I think the consumers should have way more power than I do. I just want to make sure that I can just help steer things in the right direction. So it is kind of a good for all. So I do have two rule questions that come up quite frequently in my experience (laughs) with watching two debates that happen commonly. And this was reminded to me of my friend Becca, who's a big fan out in Dubai. So I know there's going to be some people out there that are going to be listening for the answer to this. Is kicking allowed in the official rules? Yes, that counts as your hit. It does count as your hit. And then the Very other one is... Very hard, but if you can do it, yeah. good for you. So they're, they're up at that level, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you really figure out if the ball has hit the rim or not? That's one that sparks a lot of debates. That is a lot of gray area. That has yeah. uh, caused a lot of debates, <laughs> arguments, <laughs> makeups, et cetera. <laughs> I, and my answer will most likely be wildly different than what if the board were on. So I'm more of a backyard kind of fun player. 
I used to be a competitive player, but then once the company got big and we started getting millions of people, then I just started getting smoked. So um, <laughs> no longer one of the top. I usually just call it a do-over and nine times out of 10, that works. Yeah. Everybody has that friend though, that does not want to do the do-over and <laughs> needs to be right every single time. So, but yeah, that's a good one. Like I'm trying to think, I know there's been debates on it where as long as it continues in its natural trajectory and it doesn't like take a, a super crazy bounce, then some may that be considered be that good. Yeah. But I think that's going to be a never ending debate. We can Just... talk again in 10 years and I got a feeling that'll <laughs> Right, <still be>. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So be adults, guys, and just <laughs> work around it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, what's the second Maggie. question, Meg? I was waiting. It was the kicking and the hitting the rim. Those oh. were the two big ones. Yeah. Yeah. I have more of a business question. That's that's kind of my my side. I've I've got the MBA, so <laughs> I'm the guy who wouldn't have started the company probably. Like you said, you know, I would have let my pride take over. But you're a multi million dollar company and you have twenty five employees. You do everything in house. You don't have I'm assuming you don't have advertising agencies or anything. How do you manage all of that? That's a lot to handle. Yeah, it um it is a lot. And thankfully, like, you know, we, we actually just, our 28th employee just started the other day, started on Monday. Uh, Ruth, she's our second international employee. So we've got two in the UK now, everybody else is in the US. We have a distributed workforce as well. So everybody lit works from home. And the one thing that we do a little different at Spikeball than I think most companies is everybody has an abnormally high level of autonomy in what they do whether you're a seasoned executive and you've been working for 20 years or it's your first job out of college, you have a lot of say in what needs to be done. Like we hired you because you're smart and you can make decisions and you can figure things out. We did not hire you because you're really good at taking orders and following instructions. Right. Almost everybody at Spikeball, you know, we're such a young company, almost everybody here they were the first person to fill that job. So it's not like we could hand them a playbook and say, oh, here's what the last person did. Just keep, please keep doing what they did. Everybody's writing their own playbook. And they can come to me or to their direct manager for help. But what we don't want them doing is coming to us saying, what should I do? Or what do you want me to do? We want them coming to us saying, here's what I want to do. I did the homework. Here's what I think makes the most sense. I just love a second set of eyes on this. So we're developing all that expertise in-house. And just that sense of pride that comes from whether you're graduated from college a couple months ago and this is your first job, or you're 45 years old and you've been you know, working for a while. And just having that sense of ownership, I think it... it results in a great culture, but I think it also keeps a lot of that expertise in house. And it also just is so much more motivating than being told what to do. And as I share with my team, a lot of the way that I try to build things at Spikeball is what I learned. Yeah. What I learned that I hated at my previous jobs, you know, most, at least in my experience, a lot of the big corporate jobs, you're just being told what to do. You're being handed the playbook and saying, go do it. And or don't, don't get know. outside of your role because, you know, there, or you want to step into something. Well, so-and-so does that now bring it to them and let them, do their exactly. thing. you know, there's blinders around big. So I think that's huge that you allow each person to be their own on like an entrepreneur. They're working for a company and yep. working, you know, for you, but they get to, like you said, that autonomy, it's, that's huge. That's a very similar model to Lululemon is a company that I've had experience with that I work mm -hmm. with. And it's very much the same thing. And it's a huge success to keeping people and to growth and developing leaders. And it sounds like Spike Ball could eventually go into coaching companies on a <laughs> business model and a leadership style that works. <laughs> Perhaps. Lululemon has a couple more zeros after their revenue than, than they do, but uh, someday, someday. You'll get, you'll get there. Yeah. That's nope. what you're, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. From a leadership perspective, how hard was it to give out that autonomy and just be like, here, go ahead and do it? Because when I started working here in Kuwait for Taco Bell, 
the first thing I did is I cut all English advertising. I said, look, you know, we don't have to educate the Americans on what Taco Bell is. We have to educate the Kuwaitis. Everyone thought I was going to get fired within, you know, 90 days because I just kind of do. Yeah, I I went against everything. The franchise wanted to kill me because I changed the slogan on the logo to great Mexican taste because, you know, no one knew what it was here. So my boss was not very easy to adapt to it of letting me take the reins and kind of going out. But, you know, the sales proved otherwise. So how did you feel when you gave people that autonomy? Because it's nerve wracking, especially when it's the house you built. Yeah, right. And if this thing doesn't work, so I I went full time in year number five. So the first five years was kind of right the side project. And if it failed, then no big deal. I've still got my day job. We're good. But after year five, shit got real, right? Like, (laughs) I've got a mortgage, I got people that need food, myself included. So got to be super careful about this. And it's not like I'm amazing inventor. I didn't invent this game. I just kind of got lucky when I was a kid and played it and was, you know, a lot of stars were aligned. So I, I, to this day, I'm still very protective of it. In the early days, I think I talked a bigger game than I actually believed. So I remember a call with Skylar. He's actually still on our team. He's amazing. He's been around a long, long time with us. And he was working remotely from home as he always has. And I had been a proponent of, you know, I don't really care when or where you work just as long as the work gets done. And we had our, we have like weekly one-on-one calls. So he and I had our call and I think it was like, I don't know, Tuesday at like 11 AM or something. And we're just starting with our pleasantries. And I'm like, Oh, so what's going on? He's like, Oh, I just got back from a tennis match and you know, I'm a little, little winded, but all good. And I remember like, the fuck is this guy like he's playing tennis on a tuesday morning he should be working like what is going but and if he were on this call maybe he'll disagree with me but i think i caught myself and realized like wait i need to drink what i'm making here because i'm not supposed to care he's doing an amazing job at at, at what he does should i really care if he's going and playing tennis at 10 a.m on tuesday so the my ego cared, right? I'm the boss. I don't I want people kind of working and whatever. But that's that's not good for anybody and I need to, you know, uh, we that all That 10 a.m. break times, might be but, the thing that keeps him doing a good job, you know? Maybe that's what he needs to thrive in the role absolutely. and that's what he needs to be. Yeah. And I can't tell that. you how many text messages I get from him at midnight or emails at crazy right. hours and he's always on airplanes and traveling. Like <laughs> nobody works harder than him and why would I question him playing tennis at 10 a.m.? So yeah. That was a really tough one early on, but a lot of people, I read a lot of like just business books and kind of stuff like that. And saying no is a lot of, I think that what's the saying go like most companies die from indigestion, not from starvation. Another way you could look at that is, you know, you die from saying yes too much, whereas it's healthier. You need to be comfortable with saying no. And that's something to this day that I still struggle with. But the more you say no, the more you can actually focus on the important stuff. So, yeah, that's it's worked for us. And I I don't know if it works for everybody, but delegating has been a a difficult one as well. But I've I've gotten, I think, pretty darn good at it. Whereas, you know, I've been feeling the last month or two a bit like maybe I'm a little too far from the company. Like I have a pretty good understanding of going on what's going on, but the team is just killing it and doing an amazing job. And there's literally thousands of decisions in a day when you're talking like, you know, the size of business that you guys are doing. So you can't, you can't yeah. be responsible for making all of those. You got to put people in the position and trust that they're going to do the the right thing. Yeah. And that's so. another one of our values, which is yeah. trust until you shouldn't. And we use that across the board, not only with our community, with our employees. And, you know, there is a, a very high degree of trust here. And that again, results, I think, in a great, great general culture. And yeah, you just wind up liking the people you work with a lot more. And <laughs> Which that, is a weird concept for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I, there's very few people from my corporate days that I'm actually in touch with. Just, you know, the, the general environment didn't produce that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you come out to Kuwait. I mean, we've got the uh, biggest group of micromanagers in the world, I think, in this country. Like, seriously, <laughs> the, the Arab mentality is, I mean, I work at a big oil yeah. company and our chairman uh, literally looks at our fingerprint in and out. He's like going by the minute. And it's just, it's like, don't you just care if we get the job done the right way? 
and as soon as he started doing that, like morale just completely plummeted, you know, productivity went down. I'm in performance management and I was, you know, I've been screaming for months, like, dude, we got to do something here, but you know, it, it would be awesome to have someone like you come here as a speaker and just be like, Hey guys, <laughs> look, your model. Sucks. There's another way. <laughs> yeah, There's another way. Try this out. I mean, yeah. how would you convince other, you know, other businessmen? I'm sure you've been in the room with other guys and they've been like, well, you know, why are you doing this? You know, like what's your elevator pitch to something like that? I'm nervous to use the word should. Like I consider mm -hmm. that a four letter word. And anytime I'll go to like, dinner parties or be out with friends of friends or something. And they'll, you know, Oh, you're the spike ball guy. That's cool. Like, you know, you guys should do this. You should do this. And <laughs> I just want to grab them, put them against the wall. I'm like, you don't know shit about my business. Don't say shit. I know their hearts. You don't know in the my right life. Place. <laughs> yeah. I know their hearts in the right place. Right. And you know, yeah. so on that point, what I'm doing may or may not work for the vast majority of other businesses. So I'm, I'm careful to say you should do this. I do love sharing experiences and I'll sh say in my personal experience, my engagement could not have been lower when I was an employee, basically just a cog in the wheel at these giganto companies. I could not have been just more apathetic and just kind of, I'm showing up exactly at nine and I will not be there a minute after five. And that's pretty much it. But when I actually had a say in the matter and I got to make decisions and I see how my other employees, you know, and now life at Spikeball, how it's so different, you know, I can share 10,000 examples. Of that's been uh, different. But I do think like, it's interesting, like there's a lot of change going on right now, especially with COVID-19, all the companies that are being forced to do work at home, remote workforce. And, you know, we used to, I had an advisory board for a while and I remember one of the guys, he was a professor at University of Chicago and private equity guy, super, super smart, has, you know, uh, largely, I believe, you know, run a lot of businesses, very traditional ways. And even though our revenue was growing at almost 100% year over year, we're profitable and every chart is up and to the right. He still had a hard time accepting that we had a remote workforce. And like comments would just kind of come through like, well, you know, Chris, if when you do want to scale this, do understand that when you do get some larger partners, you know, if you do want to get some financing or something, they're probably not going to be cool with the remote workforce and you're going to need to change at some point. And thankfully, we're not looking for money and I'm not looking for any outside money. But even with all of these great examples of just how we've just been doing so well, some people are just still so locked to the traditional way of doing things. When the stay-at-home orders are lifted and people can go back to work, there's going to be a lot of people that don't want to. They're going to say, going hey, to boss, yeah. huge I did shift. fine it's, at yeah. home. Uh, let yeah. me stay at home. And I think the smart bosses are going to say, yes, wherever you're happy, yeah. I now know that I don't need to be literally standing over your shoulder. But the other bosses that may be a bit more insecure and just love that power, will say, no, you have to come in. And then, of course, there'll be some jobs where you physically have to be there, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's a, working in a refinery, whether it's in a warehouse or whatever, there's millions of jobs that you know, require you to be in, on site. But the ones that don't, it's going to be, I think, a pretty hard sell convincing people that you have to be in a certain place at a certain time. Especially 40 hours a week. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, I, we are very strong proponents of a 40 hour work week. And if I, you know, there's been a handful of times where I can tell employees are working well beyond that or getting mm -hmm. burned out and I'll wag a finger and say, no, you guys need your <laughs> private life. And we haven't had to force anybody to take vacation yet. We've come close, but you know, I don't want, yeah. I mean, I, I, private lives are important and yeah, I want to make sure people aren't burning it at both ends. Yeah. So looking ahead to, like you mentioned with COVID changing, maybe the remote work and you're already ahead of the game on that by offering that to your employees. But some of the other things I think to come out of this for businesses is some of the, you know, packaging and environmental impact sourcing mm -hmm. and things like that. So do you guys have any kind of plans or what do you guys already do maybe to just make sure that like products are sourced, the materials and things that you need in a environmental friendly way? Is that like a value that the company holds or is moving towards or? Yeah, it's a tricky thing. So our product actually starts in Maddie's world. This is a plastic product that begins its life as oil and eventually is turned into plastic in a factory in China. 
and it is then shipped over to the U.S. and all over the world, and our carbon footprint is significant, unfortunately. Before the COVID hit, we were talking, and we'll, we'll resume talks once we hopefully get back to a normal world, about trying to offset you know, through uh, carbon, is it carbon credits. I don't know all the, all the terminology, but mm-hmm. trying to basically get an idea of, okay, what is our carbon footprint? And what can we do to adjust to that? So, you know, we, we've been trying to, all the parts with spike ball sets used to come like in individual plastic bags. And okay, we were able to eliminate that. We're doing everything we can to recycle as much plastic and cardboard at the warehouse. And, you know, I read about a company that uh, they were harvesting used fishing nets in South America melting them down and that's becoming used for plastic. And uh, I was like, this is awesome. I would Brilliant. love to yeah. make spike ball set out of recycled plastic. We got to know that company and really good guys. Their inventory was super low. I wound up talking to a friend at, who works at Patagonia a little bit later and I was telling her this and she's like, oh, you know why their inventory is so low, don't you? I'm like, no. She's like, we bought it all. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so, Patagonia trucker hats. I guess the bills of the trucker hats are now going to be made out of recycled South American fishing nets. Oh, amazing! Uh, I'm very happy for them, but I wish they were right. Buy it all. <laughs> there will um, be another opportunity out there. The eyes are open. The connections are starting. So, yeah, yeah. it's cool that you so guys I'd are love to, at least working towards it. Yeah, I'd love to figure it out. We're we are a tiny, tiny player, and how can we? You know, we don't have any material scientists or anything like that on, on staff, but if we could do it recycled or out of some product that isn't just so damaging to the environment. You know, we do donate a lot to environmental causes. I think we gave $50,000 to team trees. So Amazing. there's going to be tons of trees planted on our behalf. And yeah, right now I think our biggest impact is cash donation more so than it is modifying our product. But and that helped. That goes a long ways. Yeah. Better than nothing, right? Yeah, so absolutely. That's, that's what we're trying to do. That's amazing. It says a lot about your brand values. And I mean, yeah. how did you, it just, it takes me back to a, a paper I read years ago and it got buried. It was uh, marketing is typically the four P's of marketing place, price, product, promotion. And, you know, someone from, I think it was uh, JWT came out and said, all right, it's going to change into the four E's of marketing which was experience, evangelism, exchange, and every place to put your product every place. And the one thing that stuck out, and I wrote a paper on this, was the evangelism part that when you have like a task force of the people that believe in your product, that believe in working for you, not only for that, but your athletes too, because it's in Kuwait, a lot of guys are saying, hey, how can we get this? You know, (laughs) that's how I was interested. I was like, how do I get this game? looks awesome. I'm seeing it on Instagram. (laughs) You know, it's kind of like this really bad tease that I can't get to. And Uh I mean, did any of that like go into your head at the beginning? Like, all right, I want everyone to be in an inclusive partnership you know, and with the values and create those values, you know, does that just go back to your childhood and how you were raised or where did all of those values come from? I think like the general direction I ask our, our employees to take really in anything they do, and especially the marketing team is I want anybody that interacts with our brand to know that there are real human beings that work at the company. Yeah. Like, so if you look at any of our social media stuff, We've got pretty funny, witty captions. And almost all of the content is hosted by the players or by the community. Like, I think we have hired, like we've been in business 12, 13 years now. I think we've maybe hired models like twice. That's it. But we want it to be as organic and just kind of grassroots focused as much as possible. And, you know, if you go all the way back to, you know, those emails out, you know, when I was still kind of doing this as a side job and I'm sending an email to those customers I, a lot of relationships started at that point. And I think like, imagine you're a customer and you buy this product and you now get an email from the CEO that says he or she is driving to the post office that night to drop off your package. Like, what the hell kind of company is that? Like, just that alone. <laughs> right. But it's kind of quirky and kind of cool. And then the person actually asks you a question like, wait, this is an automated thing. Like they actually, he noticed, he wrote that I lived in San Francisco and I do. So this is an automated thing. So there's a human there and just genuinely wants to know how I heard about it. 
So that started a lot of things. Another thing that we did, which I think has resulted in a lot of word of mouth, is we offer free replacement parts. We don't advertise it. It's not on the packaging. It's really not in writing in many places. One of our, as I think I mentioned earlier, one of our values is surprise and delight. And one mm-hmm. way that we do that fairly often is, you know, we'll get emails from somebody that says, hey, I was playing spike ball and one of my knucklehead buddies landed on it and broke it. Can I buy a new rim? Can I buy a new net or whatever it is? And, you know, they have their wallet out and they're trying to offer us money because they want to buy this. And we say, oh, hey, sorry to hear about the broken part. Um, unfortunately, we don't sell replacement parts. We only ship them for free. So would you mind giving <laughs> us your address? <laughs> They're like, wait, I'm, when's the last, I'm trying to give you guys money. And this does, but they wind up telling 10 friends about that. They're like, yeah. wait, remember the other day when so-and-so broke the set and I tried buying this. So they're now, t- and there's just that element of just humanity there. And I learned about that. You know, Maddie, you asked the question, like, where'd all this come from? I went, you guys know the Chipotle burrito yeah. brand? Yeah. So this is probably 20 years ago now, but I went on a Saturday morning with some friends. We'd had a pretty big Friday night. So rolled in there looking pretty beat up and there's like five of us and we all order. And then I think I was first in line and the guy working the register is like, Oh, are you guys all together? I'm like, no, we're all friends, but we're not paying together. And he's like big night last night. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, all right, guys, breeders are on me. I hope you all feel better. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> like, no way. That is so cool. So, you know, five burritos that probably their cost for five burritos is maybe 10 bucks. I don't know. Yeah. But I can't tell you how many times I've told that story. It costs Chipotle $10. But the fact that they give their employees the authority to do that, the amount of marketing value they have gotten from that one thing is probably worth thousands of dollars. 100%, yeah. So I remembered that. So years later, when I was actually running my own company, I was like, all right, what could we do where we actually get people telling others? Like, I don't want people to only learn about us when they see a paid ad. I want them when they're out with beers with buddies or whatever they're doing to just, I want it to come up naturally. How can we, so let's make surprise and delight a thing. You know, Skyler, who I mentioned the other day or mentioned earlier, he was in Colorado and he was telling me the other day, you know, everybody's on lockdown there's a family that lives like four doors down. He doesn't know them, but he, there's like three kids and they, they're way into sports. He walked over there the other day and just left a spike ball set on their front porch with his business card. That's awesome. Nothing. That's well, it. That's awesome. And he yeah. got a note from the mom like an hour later with a photo of the kids playing in the background, having a blast. And that's how many so cool. people is she now going to tell yeah. about that? So when we tell those stories, especially when we're interviewing people, when people light up and you can tell that they get psyched about that kind of thing, like not everybody's comfortable doing that or they, you know, aren't, aren't that into it. That's okay. But for those that are, this is a great place because employees are allowed to give away as much free stuff as they want. Just go. As long as we know somebody's going to use it, we can't track this stuff. But Maddie, to your point, the marketer who wants to just get a direct ROI on free sets, absolutely impossible. Yeah, it, yeah. But we give away hundreds of thousands of dollars of free sets every year. And our gut tells us that it's the right thing and that it's working. And we get random, all of, all employees get random texts from their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their friends or whatever. Like, oh, honey, I was on the beach the other day and I saw some kids <laughs> playing. And, uh, you know, it's, that stuff is just awesome. And it just feels really nice. And I'd never experienced any of that stuff in any of my old jobs. And I just like that all of our other employees and I'll, I'll even get that from players as well. Like they'll, they'll, Oh, my friend told me or whatever. And there's just this common sense of ownership around the whole thing that we're all kind of in this together, which, which feels really nice. That's awesome. Cause it. you can't always see it in the ROI. And I tried explaining mm-hmm. that years ago. I was like, you can't always see it on a return on investment. Like the numbers don't always give you the full story. Yeah. Yeah. If you give out a hundred thousand, they always wanted to do flyers and they're like, let's do out a hundred thousand flyers. I'm like, all right, but if you get a 0.01% return rate on that, that's that's not worth it. But if you give out free meals or if you give out a free combo or something, that's worth it because then people are talking about you. You know, you're creating mm-hmm. a buzz Absolutely. around the brand. 
And it's amazing that you talk about that. And it's gutsy, man. Like, I got to give you serious props. Like, it, it, it's got, and it's awesome. I, like, I love your brand. I love the values that you guys have. And I think one more question, and then we'll sort of let you off the hook, is Shark Tank, dude. <laughs> it said you were on Shark Tank. How was that? I mean, what did they have to say? I'm just curious. It was incredible. We filmed in September, maybe October of 2014. But it actually didn't air until it was like seven, eight months later in May of 2015. So we did a deal on the show with Damon John, but the deal actually fell apart even before the show aired. So, you know, we went on there and we didn't necessarily need the money, but I definitely wanted to be able to pick the brains of some of the sharks. Like if I did a deal with them, like just that general expertise. So, you know, we were already a profitable company growing well and the money would have been nice, but it was really that expertise after and so talk to Damon after we filmed maybe a few weeks month after we filmed and he wanted to did something like he's got friends at Marvel Comics and he wanted to make a Spider-Man branded spike ball set and felt like he was treating it as a toy and you know the mission of our company is to create the next great global sport so I didn't want it to be seen as just this little toy thing and he had a few other ideas on licensing and, you know, we didn't really have a fit. And what happens on the show is essentially a, a handshake. So neither side is legally bound to do it. But yeah, all the sharks were super nice. I was hoping that, you know, before we going on to the show, I was hoping that I'd be able to get Mark Cuban and Nick Woodman. Nick Woodman's the GoPro CEO founder. Yeah. They both went out, which was a huge bummer. But actually recently, Mark Cuban was interviewed and at, he was asked, what's the one deal that got away that you wish you would have invested in? And Spike Ball was his answer. So. Hey, oh, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. That felt pretty Very good. Cool. So, yeah, no but doubt. It was great. Like, you know, we had a first aired in May of 2015. We had a huge party at the office and, you know, probably 200 people, friends, family, et cetera. And everybody's watching it. And I was legally, I had to sign a sheet of paper that said, if you say anything that happened on this show, Chris, you are legally uh, responsible for a $5 million fine. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty easy way to get me to keep my mouth shut. That's a hefty um, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had 200 people at the party and none of them knew what was going to happen. So it was the really fun party. And the beautiful part of the show is that I didn't anticipate is reruns. You know, that was five mm -hmm. years ago and we still yeah. get reruns to this day. We get emails from retailers all over the world, maybe, maybe a couple a week from different countries. And that's kind of the norm. But about a year ago, we got emails from five different retailers in Norway in one day saying, we'd like to carry your product. Like, huh, what? Like five from Norway in one day. Yeah. It turns out that Shark Tank ran in Norway the <laughs> night before. Like, <laughs> ah, that's knew? awesome. But yeah, that's it's, it's awesome. this gift that just keeps giving and... Yeah, everybody on the show, from the producers to the sharks, they all were super nice. Even Mr. Wonderful was very complimentary and much nicer than I expected. So yeah, it was a great experience. That's so cool. I love it. I love to hear more about it. Like I said, my experience is just through some of the community and people, kind of the backyard fun. And I love what you guys have as a vision going forward with the, the sport and the company and what you're doing for your employees, I think is huge right now as well. Thank so you. thank you so much for sharing the story with us. Is there anything you want to leave? listeners in the Middle East with <laughs> any fans um, out there. <laughs> spike ball will be in Kuwait soon. I don't there we know go. where. There we go. There we go. There we promise go. that. Maddie's um, basement. <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey, I have no problem with that. <laughs> we got to talk after Is Amazon? <laughs> Is Amazon functioning in Kuwait? I couldn't get it on mm. Amazon. They wouldn't deliver it here. I tried. It's tough. It's I, tough. Uh, hmm. To the military bases, they can get APO through Amazon, um, but some things okay. will or won't ship there. So yeah, if you need help navigating that, we can definitely talk a little bit after we end the recording here. Oh, definitely. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Coming yeah. soon. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for joining us, thanks. Chris. All right. Thanks again. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Kuwait. Thank you, and join us next time.